it's good to have you back on on uh, on the show team it's been a no, few years since uh, since our last chat so thank you for joining us we have a few questions um, that we've uh, gathered up uh, from previous discussions with customers and um some also sent us questions uh, in advance for this webinar and as you have other questions along uh, during this webinar free to post them in the chat and uh, try to go over as many as possible so uh, let's uh, get dive into it directly Tim. Okay. okay so we'll start with the uh, elephant in the room which is the end of life of app v so We've had so many end of lives, uh, be it officially or um, how should I say, pronostic, uh, estimated by other folks in the industry. Is this going to stick or uh, we'll see a, an update from I Microsoft? can absolutely assure you that I don't have a clue. <laughs> okay. Uh, they certainly, I, it's my belief in talking with the folks at Microsoft that they really mean this. Uh, specifically, I think it's pretty clear that the MDOP portion um, is end of life, April 2026, no more security fixes. And there's a question in my mind of what that means in terms of the license to use AppV that came with the MDOP component. So that would be affecting folks who are on a server OS doing the RDS deployments. Um, we're not really sure about that. Now, as to the AppV client itself that's built inside of uh, Windows 10 and 11, yeah. um, we really have no clue what's going to happen there. Um, Microsoft has not made any announcements. Um, also, internally, as I talk with uh, their folks, um, quite frankly, they don't have a clue. Well, so it's my guess that the client would probably stay there. Would it itself be considered to be under uh, support for security updates and things like that after April? I don't know, right? The next release period for the OS would be the fall timeframe, assuming Microsoft doesn't change things again. So fall of 2026 would be the next one. If they were to decide they were going to pull it out, that would really be the earliest they could do it. But yeah. I don't really hear anything that says, oh, they're in a hurry to go do that. But I think as a as an enterprise company who is probably concerned with end-of-life scenarios and making sure that they're supported, um, I think it puts any company that's using AppV in a state where they really need to be looking at getting themselves migrated into what they're going to do next. Um, because of this uncertainty, you don't know what you're really going to have going forward um, once we get past uh you know mid 2026 exactly yeah so it's uh, well known that microsoft rarely deprecates something so it might run until uh, the end of windows but uh, you don't want to be on a version that's uh, without security updates or without knowing when what will the next windows operating update will, will do to your infrastructure so that's a that's another level of of uh, stress when you go back at home to, to go to bed. So, what from your internal discussions as a, as an MVP and from what you can disclose, of course, um, uh, with Microsoft and um, with other customers, what what do you see is the main recommendation for going forward? Well, Microsoft's recommendation is, and you know, hold on to your hat here, Azure. Right, which is Microsoft's answer. Big surprise. <laughs> Big surprise, right? But their recommendation is customers that are using AppV should be looking at um, Azure Virtual Desktops and MSIX as the replacement technology for this. Um, that doesn't mean that that's necessarily the right answer for every customer that's out there, uh, but that's the thing that Microsoft points you to. Yeah, and, and this is where I have, and I've had discussions with Microsoft folks too. So you go to the customer and you say, you are not only deprecating AppV, but uh, we also want to move you in the cloud. So instead of just going from AppV to a new technology, well, it's too easy for you to go to work on premise. Let's also complicate this stuff a little bit. And uh, especially because uh, with AppV, I've seen a lot of customers that were either in financial district or in, um, in health, where going yeah. to the cloud is very data sensitive. And again, 
And I don't think anyone, uh, every big hospital or bank wants to man manage their own Azure Stack HCI or other implementation of private Azure. And uh, Microsoft is still uh, stubborn on, on providing uh, more and more solutions for on-premise as a way, or this is my suggestion, as a way to making us familiar with the tech so we can then consider going to the cloud after we've switched from AppD or from other similar tech that's mm -hmm. currently running only on-premise and then you, you go. And uh, I, I know there is another thing that they're pushing hard with the uh, Office 365 on RDS machines, mm -hmm. which it's kind of silently in the news, mm -hmm. but nobody's really talking about it. And we'll find out that in a few years, you can't run that either locally. So you'll have to be in the cloud. Yeah, so, I think, you know, I think yeah, you're, you've nailed that on, on the head. I don't think anyone's saying that, you know, RDS is going away effectively, but um, I don't think it's a, it's not a point of emphasis in, in, mm -hmm. inside of Microsoft. And we are seeing these signs of those things. They do have their multi-user Windows 10, which is sort of their defined replacement for that, but that is only an Azure capability. Yeah. You can run the multi version, uh, multi user version of Windows 10 in other clouds or even on prem. So, um, although possibly with Azure Stack, uh, that might be a possibility. I'm not really sure exactly how that one works out. But yeah, I, I think that the idea that the server has to have all of the features of the end user desktop platform is something that doesn't make a lot of sense internally within Microsoft. I mean, it did for a while. Um, at this point, yeah, they think you should be moving to more of a VDI style. Yeah. Um, obviously, Microsoft would love that to be up on Azure, um, yeah. and they're going to try to make it convenient for you to do that. Uh, but I think that any customer that was using AppV in that type of environment with the RDS really needs to take a look at um, where they plan to go going forward. And it might mean that everyone who's using what you have today will end up with different solutions within their company in the future. So everything doesn't have to go one way only. Um, and so you really need to look at the use cases and what really makes sense it, for you going forward. Definitely won't be that way. So it's, uh, I, I've seen customers and and especially customers that didn't had experience with, uh, with AppV and they were going, okay, but uh, MSIX brings me this and that, but then I need to learn how to run the apps in MSIX. I need to learn how to manage them. And uh, it's just confusing for them. And this, all of this, excluding the nightmare of managing digital certificates inside a packaging organization and stuff like that. Yeah. But let's get yeah. back to our friends from, from the app feed because they, they have a lot more experience running virtualized apps. They are well aware of the benefits of running those and some of the hurdles of doing that. Why would the, they be interested in, in MSIX? Okay. Well, they need to look at why they were using AppV because there's multiple reasons that they would be using AppV. And it's usually a mixture of a bunch of those, right? Um, one of them is the ability to have a user log into a machine that doesn't have the application and to get that application rapidly. And so MSIX in the MSIX app attach mode provides that similar type of capability. They can log in, we bring in the applications quickly, um, not quite as fast as AppV, but good enough, right? Yeah. It's good enough for the end users. Um, and that's one reason that they would have been using AppV in the past. And MSIX makes a lot of sense for that going forward. In this mode, MSIX App Attach is basically an app layering product. So um, the other reason people used AppV was for the compatibility aspects. To be able to get that type of isolation between the different applications and not have to worry about this application interfering with another one or the operating system itself. And that's what MSIX gets you, whether you're using the app attach or not, yeah. you get that. And so um, sometimes still moving that. into MSIX, while the implementation might be a little different, some of your users might be using the app attach, some might not, um, but the package is basically gonna be the same. I mean, there's a small conversion format that goes out at the end to get the app attached, but it's basically the same yeah. amount of work in the same package. What needs to be pointed out here is that app attach runs only on Windows Enterprise editions. So I don't remember if there were any requirements on the Windows editions for AppV, to be honest, in the past. 
Um, but, I believe it worked on enterprise and professional. Exactly, because we yeah. here, we were like a, under 100 people company. So we, we run mostly a professional edition. So we never had problems with that. And at one point I said, okay, I need enterprise edition to, to run App Attach on my machine. And uh, I didn't, actually, I didn't even know that. Yeah, I'm just uh, upgrading a new laptop and uh, I, I've planned specifically for it to be enterprise from day zero. So I don't have to run VMs and stuff like that for AppAttach. And um, it might be just a, a, a limitation again to push you because to manage AppAttach, you need to be on AVD and in the Azure cloud again. Uh, it runs on a local machine. So if you want to play with it, uh, want to deploy it locally okay. to, to test the packages, you okay. can run it, but you just don't have the tools to properly manage it at scale. Uh, okay, so, so that brings up, I think, a very subtle point with MSIX Appetach. The MSIX Appetach, in the way that I think you just described it, is specifically associated as an Azure feature. Yeah. And so to yeah, get yeah. that. Yeah, um, yeah. Other companies have integrated the app attached style, and they quite often will refer to it as MSIX app attached themselves. Um, and so uh, if you uh, are a Citrix customer, for example, um, you can do the MSIX, including the app attach through them and not be on Azure. And I believe also VMware, um, in addition to their cloud volumes, they've also done an integration that is an app attached style as well. So you can still get that instant start up Pro there and I don't exactly. think exactly and, and prob probably they use, use exactly the same technology only that they're providing their own management infrastructure on top of it because yeah. the way I manage my test packages is just a bunch of PowerShell scripts which I run them or whenever I want it but you don't want to do that for thousands of employees yeah basically it's 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 a you know mounting of of a uh, disk Exactly. Followed by a registration process to get you the integration so that the user can launch the application. Exactly. And those are all scheduled to, to be on. And now, uh, since we're mostly looking at the AppV folks going from uh, AppV to, to MSIX, and won't, we won't be talking yet about other formats, so we'll just focus on this a bit. Uh, I know that you, over the last three years or so, you, you've been running some stats on some uh, comparisons. So you have a bunch of apps that you've seen from uh, your customers in your consulting gigs. Mm -hmm. And uh, every January or so, you were comparing those to the, to the latest uh, format MSIX updates from Microsoft and seeing how many work, how many don't compare to what you've seen in AppV. Well, I, I see you put the link up for um, that yeah. white paper so that people can go ahead and, yeah. and download that. So that is the, the latest report from last January, the end of January, I did that. And first of all, before... I even talk about it, I do want to be very clear because I, I hear lots of folks in the packaging industry talk about percentages of applications that are compatible. And to be very clear, the numbers that I give is a very high bar for compatibility, right? Uh, I think most of the time you'll see a vendor, I mean, we even, even Microsoft themselves when they first started out, you know, their criteria for what was compatible was, oh, I've packaged, I've delivered, there's a shortcut, I hit the shortcut, and the app comes up on the screen without an error. That's compatible. And that's yeah. not my level of compatibility. My level of compatibility is more in line with what an enterprise would use for their UAT tests. So it's not only does the app come up, did the pre-configuration you put in place, meaning things like the updaters have been disabled, did those actually take effect? Um, if the user wants to make additional changes to configuration, um, do those changes stick around? And when they do subsequent runs of that application, do they get to keep that stuff? Yeah. Does the basic functionality work? If there are important things like file associations or shell extensions that the user typically would use as a way to launch the application instead of the shortcut, do those work as well? So for me, when I say compatible in this report card, it means that all of those things have been checked and it works. And basically, it's answering the question, if you were deploying that package through AppV or you know, some other way today, if you changed it out with this MSIX package, would that end user really notice the difference in functionality? And if the answer to that question is no, then I call it compatible. So with that criteria, these latest numbers here, we ended up with just under 79% in that compatible mode. Now, there's another 20% that were in the uh, subjective range. So the basic functionality of the app is there, but there may be some minor things like you didn't get the context menu um, or something like that. 
In some companies, that's going to be enough to say, no, that's not good enough. I'm not going to deliver that to my end users. And other companies, they say, yeah, that's fine. So that's how I put those in that subjective range. Now, all of those numbers were on the basis of taking the vendor's installer and recapturing and creating that MSIX package. Now, in terms of any changes from that report card to now, um, I have done some things in the PSF to fix a few things up, but nothing that would significantly change those numbers yet today. This is one topic that I wanted to touch the PSF. So PSF, by PSF, we mean the package support framework, guys. So just Google that for you okay. to find out what it is. You'll find some links. And um, uh, this helps you solve compatibility issues that you'll have with the applications package as an MSIX. I believe that you get to that 79% using the PSF fix-ups right. from yeah, Microsoft you don't bring and in the, the ones PS that you contributed uh, privately on those. Yeah, if you don't bring in the PSF, you're going to get about um, 40%. We don't run the same uh, tests that you do because mm -hmm. uh, for us, it's kind of harder to do it without PSF in advanced install. So for, for you, you have your PSF tooling and TMX edit that you add on top of your Microsoft packaging tool. When we do the test with advanced installer, basically for us, the package support framework was integrated from day zero. So stuff like uh, working directory, shortcut parameters, those were mm -hmm. like the obvious things that should be included in the package. So we try to never miss out on those. And then once Microsoft made it public and documented uh, how we can use and leverage the PSF, we started adding... Uh, automatic file uh, fix-ups for file redirections, uh, even entire folder redirections, because we've seen users that were installing files or, or their applications were expecting files to be in folders that were not virtualized by the container of the MSIX package. So here you'll find solutions on the market depending on the tool you use. You go with uh, the MSIX packaging tool, then I highly recommend uh, adding on top tools that Tim has built and he has documented quite extensively. If you're going to other pri uh, proprietary tools like advanced installer or others in the market, then uh, you'll find different integrations. What is important to know is that we all uh, follow the um, documentations from Microsoft. So if your team's including a fix up in the MSIX package, advanced installer or other tools should be able to load that. Um, config JSON file, which is documenting the fix up and, and uh, uh, re reuse it or edit it to, to be able to customize the package because you will get to the point where you want to edit existing packages. And that's another story because uh, with, uh, with the MSIX packaging tool, you need to edit the package while as with the uh, advanced style, you can edit the project. We provide an intermediary state. Uh, which, which so, is actually a, a, a great capability because it actually allows the end user to be able to do some things you really couldn't do through my tooling because you actually are creating a, a full project, yeah. uh, which means you can make the kinds of changes that um, a developer would be making in terms of building that package. Exactly. Um, and, you know, uh, so I, I, I think in the end, if a company is looking to get the absolute best level of compatibility, as they try to move to MSIX, um, having multiple ways to create those packages and to be able to you know, try it in this tool. If you have a problem, try it in this other tool. Maybe exactly. you can um, get a little further along. That makes a lot of sense for companies. And we usually see in most professional teams, we, we see uh, multiple tools being used by teams. So there is one main default tool and a workflow around that, but there you always find scenarios for us, for example, with converting packages to MSIX, the most common scenario is when Microsoft finds something in their repository of test apps, which isn't shared with any of its MSIX partners, and somehow they fix it without documenting it anywhere them. And at one point, somebody from our team or a customer says, hey, this is working with the packaging tool, but it's not working with advanced install. And we're like scratching our heads. Let's reverse engineering what's happening there. Uh, but uh, well, it's nicer when they fix things and not tell anybody. It's much better than that than when they break things and don't tell anybody. <laughs> yeah, that, that happens too. So uh, from um, from your uh, um, tests in converting those packages, mm -hmm. were you mostly doing manual work, automating? How okay. Um, in terms of the, of, of the conversion, no, I, I, I've actually do that through an automated process, which is what I think um, a lot of companies would want to start with in terms of that journey if they had AFI packages. Now, I originally looked at the conversion. I only have a blog post up 
from about uh, three I think or I four added a link, ago. but uh, it's somewhere. This one is linked. So later on uh, in, in this notes, um, people can find the link, the plan for automation. The, the, well, that's the plan for automation. But yeah. about three or four years ago, I looked at converting at the packages over. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was at a point that we didn't have a workflow doing that that allowed us to bring in the package support framework. And we, yeah. we leveraged the, the Microsoft packaging tool to do the conversion. Um, and quite frankly, it wasn't very good at it. And my conclusion at the end of that, if anyone went and looked up that, that blog post, was that, yeah, if you're doing the conversion, it's probably worth it because it's not a lot of work to create the packages in this fashion. But you're going to get a very low success rate. You know, it was going to be like 20%. Mm -hmm. Um, and if it didn't work, your only hope was to say, okay, then I'm going to manually create the package from scratch That's, doing the yeah. install capture thing, right? Um, I took a look at that again this spring, and I haven't gotten to the point of, of publishing any results on that. Um, and because now we do have the ability to get the PSF in there. And so that definitely, be, I mean, so much yeah. of the stuff that Appy had in it really depended on having those types of capabilities Packet support framework is how you get those capabilities, allowing the application to make changes to files that are part of the package, for example. So um, I took a look at doing that, and I don't have the official numbers quite yet. I'm still uh, working on it. But as I work that through my tools, um, what I'm seeing is about a 60% level of compatibility. Now, that is somewhat dependent. There are some caveats on that. Um, number one caveat on that is this is talking about packages that do not have any app package scripts in them because those, exactly. that's something I know is 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 a problem and needs it's to be a dealt sensitive with. topic when you go to come yeah and we, we we'll, we'll probably get to that later on um, but just in terms of just general applications if you weren't doing any scripting to do customization at the client side then um, I'm looking at about sixty percent right now is, is what we can get. Um, yeah. The biggest problem outside of the scripts that I saw in that process was really applications that had shortcuts to things that weren't executable. So if you had shortcuts to files that used the file association as a way to bring in, um, those are not converting over. Um, and that's that's a case where I think that um, the technique that your tooling has of bringing that in and being able to create a project out of it and then exactly. add the shortcut back in would make sense for customers in that sense. Exactly. It also allows you to easily maintain the project and customize if you need something slightly changes in, in the shortcut names or mm -hmm. even icons. We've seen customers that just wanted to modify yeah. the package to change the icon to add their trademarks, stuff like that. But uh, because we, we maintain a project, an intermediary state of a project, uh, it also helps in the cases where you really don't have an acceptable package as an MSIX format. And in that point, you just say, okay, from this project, build me an MSI. So I don't want an AppV anymore. I just want the MSI and, and I'll deploy it to the classical old way. And you don't have to do all the conversion work all from scratch. You maintain the same source, the same intelligence nodes, whatever you've added into that project. And um, besides that, exactly as you said, uh, we've done a little bit of work to support non-EXE shortcuts in that part from batch files to html files some mm -hmm. people the basic stuff of running the html's and it was crazy like uh, the file was loading okay but because the end users changed the encoding when they saved the file on some versions of windows mm -hmm. wasn't working that was a few years back i, I still remember that it haunted us for <laughs> a little while yeah but, uh, and i think you know with with um you know native install capture uh, what i found on this was surprising me my you know my tools handled those types of things just great as well. Um, yeah. But the conversion from AppV, all of those shortcuts were just gone and there was no evidence left in the package. The Microsoft packaging tool actually removed all of the evidence that existed that there ever was a shortcut. And that's why um, I think, well, I haven't tried that um, in, in your tool. I suspect the just the basic way that you go about it and your approach at it is more suitable to those types of packages. Yeah, so basically, I don't think we remove anything in advanced installer because we have what we do when we eliminate things that we think are noisy are in the uh, repackaging stage. So when you're converting yeah. from scratch, then yeah, we can ignore an uninstall shortcut or an uninstall EXE or stuff. But if you're converting an app V to MSIX, in that page, we're not actually doing any repackaging. We're just 
unzipping the package, look in the manifest and import the resources. We, we map them accordingly. Then of course the mapping, the second mapping in the project where we assign them to MSI resources or MSIX, if you're building an MSIX from that project. And uh, it's something that we continuously improve depending on uh, the feedback that we get and the packages mm -hmm. that we get from the customers. And, and here I want to touch a sensitive point. Every time you're testing an MSIX package and something is not working, try to send it or either to us, either to Microsoft, either to Tim, preferably to us or to Tim, because Microsoft, I don't know when they will have a look over your package, but we, we usually try to examine them as fast as possible and to see how we can improve those, um, uh, the applications or at least nag Microsoft if it's something that it's under, out of, outside of our control, because sometimes that happens too. Before we touch the, the, the next sort of topic, because we partially talked about automation, uh, I remember about one thing that it was quite a favorite topic for me in AppV packages. You had the option to, to specify the, the level of priority for a shared resource. So like if you had a registry in the package conflicting with a registry from the machine or from another package, you could define priorities for those packages. Mm -hmm. Is this something that we have? Because I don't remember seeing anything okay. about it in MSX. Um, in, in, in MSX, so so what you're referring to is I don't is is probably not I, I wouldn't have used the word priority, but there are there settings is. on a file. I'm sorry, not file, but at a folder and registry key basis um, that's called merge override and, and exactly. override local. And exactly. and basically, um, if you had the override local setting, it meant that anything running inside the package could not see the equivalent folder natively. And that, that was a, a big solution that AppV had in place that quite frankly was for laziness on the part of customers deploying the packages, because it meant that you could have your older version natively installed. You could now bring out this new mm -hmm. AppV package and that new AppV package would work without any conflict because it couldn't see the older version. Now, it's kind of a cool feature. It allowed people to be a little bit lazy. We yeah. do not have the same thing in MSIX. Everything is the equivalent of merge with local. Yeah, so so. Uh, if there are additional files, you'll still get priority. The package will see its files first or registry settings if there is a conflict. But if there are additional things on the local system, the application can see those. So we don't really have a solution for that, at least yes. today. The it is something is that to... could get added into the package support framework. I just don't see that happening. By you or by us, because by I don't me. see it. <laughs> okay, good. I say I, this isn't something that I think I'm going to do because I don't think it's that big of an issue. I think that people can um, manage yeah. their deployments a little bit better to exactly. solve that problem. Yeah, it's, it's, they need to train their muscle to be more um, more clean in, in their infrastructure. Yeah. So uh, back to our favorite topic, the scripts. <laughs> the scripts. Yeah. This is the part when I always deliver bad news to a customer evaluating MSIX. What's your experience with them? Um, my experience is in the end, customers end up trying not to use the MSI scripting. We do have a scripting solution that's available through the package support framework. Um, but you first need to think about why you were doing that scripting initially in AppV. And there's two major class of classes of that. One is you wanted to lay down a dependency. You got a device driver. We can't virtualize those things. It needs to get put down. And so you could use AppV with the scripting as a way to deliver that. Um, that capability just simply outright does not exist with the scripting for MSIX. You're just not going to be able to do that. Um, there's going to need to be an elevation prompt for someone to do any of that type of installation yeah. work. And MSIX does its darndest to get in your way anyway. So just give up on that and treat those people, those pieces as separate dependencies. The other use of the scripts is to do customization at the delivery side. So you want to understand and have information about who the user is, what machine they're on, or something like that. And you need to make some changes to the configuration of the package on that basis. It might be injecting a license. It might be configuring uh, a backend where a backend database is or whatever. Those types of things are largely doable in the MSIX scripting we have available in the package support framework. It's a little bit different. You're going to have to manually look at your scripts and probably rewrite them to get them to work. But I think you can get there. 
what I see customers end up doing is they just decide, you know, I'm not going to do it with scripts anymore. Um, so they're not doing a lot of that today. That may change over time. But so right now, using they're just external, saying, I'm going to solve that a different way. They're, they're using external tools to manage user data personalizations and stuff yeah. like that. Because yeah. basically, if that's on the machine, the application will see it uh, as long as it's in the expected paths or, or registry location, even if it's not inside the package. Yep. Then you kind of lose a little bit of the cleanliness of being in the package, but it depends on on uh, the customization that you you need. To be honest, for for uh, um, before you gave me this detailed explanation, I was quite a little bit uh, scared about approaching this topic with customers because I didn't have good news, and I always remember there was the documentation, and you had like twelve or sixteen uh, tr different triggers for scripts in AppV. You could deploy a script, well, a script when the package was published, when the virtual environment was uh, initialized, and so on. Whereas yeah. with MSX, you have like two big swans when you launch the application, when you close the application. It, and in my mind, that created like a huge, huge limitation. Like you can't do all, all the magic that you are doing. But it seems yeah, like people weren't doing that much. Start an application magic. with a run once setting, which is one of the options in there, is the equivalent of anything that people were doing in AppV with an add or publish script. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in terms uh, of the trick. And uh, you mentioned one more thing um, um, about the elevation prop. So uh, for those of you that don't know, MSX comes by default per user deployment, no administrative rights. There are cases where you can uh, exceptionally include the application, even in the Microsoft Store. So Advanced Installer Express is published in the store as an MSIX, and it allows the users to, it is allowed to ask for elevation, but it was published in the store with uh, Microsoft's blessing. So we had to pray a lot of uh, a lot of time for them to allow it because the, the argument was why don't you why don't you allow us to do it when the MSI expecting obviously security is the main thing so they need to really trust you to put it there but most of the apps will be per user from your uh, experience with customers how will this uh, in, impact their deployment so I would assume many had per machines am I wrong. Um, no, I think most customers really do end up uh, deploying on a per user basis. Um, we would see in the RDS server, um, we'd see a lot of machine level deployments that were going on there. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be the big case. Um, now there is an equivalent of the of the machine publishing, and that's using the uh, publishing through a provisioned package method, um, which means that you would be putting it down once on the machine. And then as users log into that box, then they complete their per user publishing uh, at that time. Yeah. And so you can get the effect of the, of the uh, machine level publishing there. Yeah. Um, it's just a different way that you have to deploy the package. Yeah, uh, to be honest, I didn't play that much with the provisioning part, but uh, I've seen somebody, uh, a few folks complaining about it in the instance that they were saying, hey, if the package is not provisioned before the first ever login of the user, it won't be visible. I don't know if that was a bug or was uh, something incorrectly tested by um, those users. I, I think it's a misreading of the Microsoft documentation. Um, right. the, the, the Microsoft documentation says that you have to do it before a user profile exists. And mm -hmm. I, I think that that's not what that scenario you talked about is used. If I have a machine and I'm logged in um, you know, the, with a given user account and I add the provision stuff in, if I log out, log in, I will get that package. That's okay. Cool. I will have to log out and log in to get it, yeah. but um, I will get That's, it. It's um, the usual indication you get from the help desk. And, and, and just so people understand, you know, this pre-provision thing isn't this really weird, unusual thing. Most of the apps that are AppX and, and MSIX that Microsoft is delivering on your OS today are pre-provisioned. They're either in there from um, the image itself and they're placed in, in a pre-provisioned mode. And when you log in, you get them. And then some of them are more like the, the, the regional apps, like in my part of the world, Candy Crush comes down. And, but that's still deployed on a pre-provisioned basis so that if someone, a different user logged into my laptop, they'd also yeah. get Candy Crush right away because that's really, really important. Yeah, yeah. A, a lot of Candy Crush similar applications I've seen, especially on Windows 11 machines. It's... Yeah. Yeah. But if you just went into PowerShell and, you know, asked it, uh, uh, you know, get AppX package, package, 
Exactly. You, you, you'd be amazed at how many things are actually in the OS today that are either AppX or MSIX. Yeah, we got the same feeling. So at one point, we, we developed a small free utility tool. It's called Hover. So it allows you to launch an external exe inside the container of an uh, uh, application. It could do the same for AppV and for MSIX. And uh, basically, it was a one window application, which was listing with get AppX package of the package on the machine and say, select the app that you want to run. And on a clean machine, it was like, hey, why do we have so many apps installed here? I didn't install anything. So we had to add a filter like ignore Windows applications. <laughs> right. Or a huge scroll bar. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I remember in one of your posts, it's not the one that I'm linking here. Maybe I mixed it up. Mm -hmm. uh, talked about the, the ideal, how an ideal project would look like from your perspective. Yeah. When you, would you want uh -huh. to detail that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, we can we can talk about that one a little bit. So this was in essence a high level thing, not a, not a low level post, but just to sort of say, okay, if I'm going to be looking at doing some type of conversion, what are the things that I need to be thinking about and looking at as part of that process? And so um, when a company is doing something like that, I mean, they're really talking about a migration project. And usually the first step in any migration project is to first understand what do you have and then do I still really need it? So what things really need to go over? There should be some rationalization that occurs. Now, if you're talking about converting over from AppV, the first half of that's really easy because it's what AppV packages do I have? Exactly. Right? That's really easy. When it's, you know, I'm converting over because I'm going to go from say RDS into VDI, there you got to consider all of the different software that's out there. And even if you were using uh, maybe config manager in the past or whatever, you still don't have a good list of what those are. So you really have to go through a whole discovery phase to figure that out. So with AppV, that becomes a little easier. These are the apps I'm concerned with um, that I need to take forward, right? So once you've done that, you've done a little rationalization. Is this the version we still want? Do we have three apps that are basically PDF creators and maybe we can consolidate to one to make our lives easier? Um, that's the type of time frame that you want to be looking at that. So you, once you get your app list together, then you look at how do you want to convert? So um, when I went through a conversion this spring, so part of my work, I took you know the same applications that um, I use in uh, that report card that we did, because I actually create 96 applications in AppV. I create 96 applications in MSIX. And I bring in the package support framework, and that's how I come up with the numbers that are in that chart. I took those 96 app V packages and basically used the Microsoft packaging tool with a PowerShell script to convert those over into your basic MSIX. No package support framework in there. Yeah. Fed that into the script that then used uh, my tooling, the TM Edit X, to analyze and add in the PSF. And so it was basically a one button button click, go out, play some golf, come back, work a little bit, take my wife out to dinner, come back in the morning, and I've got my 96 packages, right? And now it's a test thing. And as a quick, easy way to get you to, you know, what would be like that 60% number I talked about, um, that would be a, a really easy approach to get to that point. The biggest effort is actually going to be that testing effort. Yeah. Um, and then for the other ones that don't work, there you're going to want to look at, okay, well, what do I do about those? You've already taken the easy 60%. So that other 40% probably means that about half of those you're going to be able to get to work in MSIX and the other half you won't. And you're going to have to consider what your approach is going to be to deal with those. Hybrid is coming back strong on this one. So it was like with that, v, uh, you would see higher high and higher rates of people going to 90, 95%. I, I've seen people that were using the entire app V server infrastructure and stuff. And because many of them were just deploying them with SCCM and stuff like that. But now mm -hmm. with MSIX, it's uh, basically 100% that you will not have all the applications as an MSIX. So you, yes. you, you need to plan carefully for what you do. Is it if, if you're going to MSIX, are you using something like NumeSent or other solutions from VMware for virtualization if you want to go on virtualization or you just go back to playing all MSI and PowerShell app deployment toolkit and yeah, I mean anyone that's that's looking at this type of project, uh, you know, should be looking at those other options and and you know, talking to them, you know, kick the tires a little bit. Uh, you know, certainly don't take the the vendor's word for 
how good their product is. You're going to need to take some of your apps and go through and, and really do the test yourself and make sure that you're getting the kind of coverage that you need to have. So uh, I think this is the last question that we've prepared before we get a look over the ones from uh, from our users today. And I'm not an expert on Citrix, but uh, I've seen a lot of users uh, talking about uh, considering switching from Citrix to AVD and considering their, their app deployment strategy going forward and, and management. So mm -hmm. what do you see? Maybe it's something more, uh, for example, we've seen a lot of, of strong adoption of AVD in Northern Europe, not so much in, in, in other parts uh, of the world. Maybe it mm -hmm. depends on the type of customers that we reach. Well, what is your feeling on, on this? Well, if you, the, the question is stated here, right? Um, yeah. If you're in that scenario, MSX, FATACH on AVD is the most straightforward replacement for what you're doing today. Now, that might also be with Citrix still, right? Um, yeah. Because Citrix uh, does provide some great management capabilities on top of that type of deployment that you do need to be considering. But if, you're, if your goal at this point is you want to get off of Citrix, then um, yeah, I think that that's uh, a AVD with Appetach is probably your closest closest equivalent. You know, if you need to keep the stuff uh, on-prem, then you know, that's not really going to work for you. As you said, uh, rollouts, more rollouts and tests are, are uh, the best option in this to, to get it started easily yeah. and uh, don't want um, to play I, with I it. Did, I did see some numbers and is the numbers were... Um, the, the source of the numbers are, are, are questionable in that they may have uh, a bias in based on how they gathered the information. But uh, and based on the, uh, that information, it was, it was hinting that if you take a look at ABD deployments that are out in the world, mm -hmm. you have a lot of very small deployments um, yeah. and a, a huge number of small deployments. And there are a smaller number of large deployments but all of the large deployments, companies that have put up, you know, thousands, 10,000 desktops, um, they are only number. using Citrix to do that almost yeah, exclusively. It's, it's change all the management infrastructure for that over the night. It's, it would create a lot of downtime for them. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, um, probably that's why we see, because it, it aligns with the feedback that we got from some of the service providers, companies that we've talked and said that, when they are providing packages for AVD, they had like small companies in, in the northern side of Europe. And that fits with the type of clients that you see in Germany, Denmark, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Don't have like Bank of America with 100,000 users or British Petroleum, which has, again, yeah. lots well, of Well, you know, as I'm talking to, the, uh, to those kinds of larger customers, um, mm -hmm. all of them are doing some work with AVD, yeah. but the idea is they're just not taking everything and going that way. Um, but there are some workloads that it just kind of makes sense to be doing it that way. And a lot of other workloads that it just doesn't. So let's, uh, we have 15 more minutes and we have uh, six questions here. And uh, one of them I already recognize. So Mike Ray is a, is a fan of our show. He's constantly joining us. So thank you, Mike, for joining us today again. And he has a really interesting question. So how dangerous would it be to continue to sequence apps? I assume app V apps right until end of life. So somebody likes to live in another shop. I don't think I have a, an historic um, comparison, but I have only 15 years in the industry. So maybe you have other tales to, to share with us. I have a customer that's still on app V4. Not okay. 4.5, so it's four. <laughs> huh? Well, four point whatever. Yeah, 4.5. Yeah. 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 Um, isn't something I would recommend, but is there a reason not to do that? Um, the only reason would be that if you got to a point that you know Microsoft said, oh, hey, in um, 26H2, the AFI client's not going to be there. Now you've dramatically shortened your window to get onto something next. And since there is no something next that meets 100% of your needs, because AppV is such a great compatibility piece in itself, and you're going to be looking at dealing with applications that you probably haven't looked at in five or six years in your current portfolio, forget about the new stuff you're doing. Some of that stuff is probably pretty old applications that you haven't had to look at in a long time. You're going to need time to work through this process to figure out what you're going to do next. And so that's where, um, you know, just going up to the very end and saying, I'll just wait until I really have the problem um, is, is risky. Risky is like a 
putting it mildly, <laughs> in my opinion. But, uh, so we have here a question from Paul. Uh, our company has a lot of in-house written applications that are dependent on Sybase version 16.0. I'm not familiar with Sybase, but let's say it's a, it's a dependency like just like you have with .NET and others. And we currently use app v5 with sccm to manage this we have been unable to package cybase as an msix due to limitations with container unable to share dependencies packages and we struggle on how we can move those applications to msix do we have any recommendations here so we're talking about dependencies uh, so cybase would would I believe basically be a uh, a database client side, and you're just dealing with a database on the back end. Can they put that in the image? Wouldn't uh, um, I'm well. I'm guessing probably it isn't in the image that it, that's over in a back end, and communicating yeah. with it is not the issue here. But if you're talking about dependencies and multiple packages uh, that you're using, probably the connection group feature in AppV. There's a couple of different things we end up having to talk about. And, and people want to just say, oh, I have this. I want to go directly to this. But it's really going to require some, some thought and understanding of the specifics of what you were trying to do and then where you want to go. But there's two possible directions within MSIX. One is the shared package container. That is a Windows 11 only solution. It does not work on Windows 10. It also has problems if you need the package support framework in that package. Shared package container probably is not going to be the solution for you. The second approach is the modification package, which might actually be what kind of comes into play in this yeah. scenario, I'm guessing. That it's not a dependency like, oh, I've got a, a VC runtime or a, a Java and I want to keep that as a separate package. Right. If it's that type of thing, I just say throw it in the MSIX package and be done with it. You know, just have one package with all of the dependencies in it and your problem goes away. That's the simplest solution to do that. But for things where you want to have, um, like I had a, a, an email exchange with a customer this morning that um, was looking at a, a different application, but basically they had ODBC connectors and they were using the AFI connection group as a way to do that. You'd have the base package. And then in this separate package, they would put in the ODBC connectors and use the AFI connection group as a way to make those things work together. And, and that's that's fine. I see a lot of customers do that type of work through AFI scripting, quite frankly, instead, but that, that would be a way to do it. But the equivalent of that in MSIX is really that modification package where you have the package from the vendor and we create a modification package that has your specific configuration items. And that's the only thing in that package. And the nice thing with that solution is that then when the vendor upgrades or you upgrade the, the, the primary package in there, you don't have to touch that configuration package unless there's some incompatibility because, you know, yeah. they change things it's and you have to the, configure it. The file layout or stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, well, the only difference between what you're doing in the AppV world and there is that in the AppV world with those two packages, you could deploy them in any order. And with the modification package, there is an order dependency. You have to put down the main package first, then yeah. you can add in that modification package, but then you can upgrade the main package as many times as you want and not have to worry about it. Uh, so, so that's usually what people end up going towards for those scenarios. One other uh, requirement that I remember encountering for modification packages, and I haven't played with them at least this year, it was that they were requiring the main package to be uh, placing the files under the VFS folder. So if you are doing folder insights like the equivalent of PVAT in, in AppV, then the, the modification was just not going to work because you didn't know where to apply those and how to combine the shared image, those two containers. Yeah, and that's exactly why I do all my MSIX packages in that form. However, if a developer creates their package, um, they might not do that, yeah. right? They might put them. So then it becomes a question of, well, where does the developer put that configuration information? Uh, because quite often, the most logical place for the developer to put that type of information would be um, in a VFS folder in the package anyway. That, yes. That'll depend in that case, yeah. right? So uh, one more question. Uh, do, do you see the questions? I don't know if you can see the questions. Uh, no, I do not see the questions. So surprise uh, me. So yeah, uh, Ryan has here a question. I work in an environment where we have a one-way trust with a central domain where all the user AD account exists. 
This means that we can only reliably deploy applications to machine accounts. This has presented problems whereby users with pre-existing profiles on the machines do not receive the MSIX packages we want to deploy. What pathway forward do you see in this scenario? So basically, hmm. they can really deploy reliably deploy applications only to machines accounts because okay. they have a central domain where all, all the AD accounts exist. So everything is on-premise. So hmm. Good luck going to cloud once again. <laughs> um, but uh, I still, I'm sort of su su surprised that that is an issue. But I, you know, I can't say that I've ever been in that scenario to to, to test it. So we talked about right. earlier is is the approach that I would be thinking about, which is the you know try the pre-provision thing. That may yeah. well work with this because the pre-provision would be on the machine, and as long as um, you've got that basis as a way to deploy, I assume through. Uh, config manager in tune, yeah. um, even autopilot as a way to get those things down. You might start with autopilot, but you still use Intune to put them on in that uh, case. Exactly. Um, that that probably ends up being the solution. But given that I don't fully understand the problem and why that was a problem to begin with, they, they, they can follow up on your blog if if they yeah. want. So they can find your email on your blog and they they can give you more details on, on this. Yeah, yeah. We always like to hear about interesting issues like this. Yes. So. Uh... Anonymous user just saying that, hey, Parallel RIS also supports AppAttach. So uh, I didn't know that. Everybody uh, sorry, was that me. Parallels, you said? Parallels, yes. So oh, okay. I didn't know they oh, had I didn't know that. that. That's okay. great. Okay. Good job. Uh, can MSX be deployed with Microsoft in June? Yes. Yes can do that. And, and, and uh, I, but, you know, under the covers, so folks understand the way the Intune is doing things, they're moving to this uh, underlying platform called Winget as a way to actually do those deployments. And I'm really excited about what they're doing there with Winget. It's actually a very extensible platform. The documentation and the ability for people to extend it right now is a little shaky, but uh, you know, I think five years from now, um, that's gonna be a really exciting space. Five years is a long time. <laughs> <laughs> One more question from Mike. MSIX performance versus a app clean. Does MSIX perform better with larger apps? like Autodesk's or, so I assume that by larger, okay. he means gigabytes in size apps, yep. not to. Okay, so um, we're, in this case, we're not, I'm assuming we're not talking about speed of deployment. We're talking about performance of the app once it's there and you try to run it. Um, so um, let's, let's address that in two different forms. One is MSIX Direct and the second would be in the app attach mode because it is, it is different. Um, the, App V package, assuming it's fully cached on the machine versus MSIX, the runtime portion of that um, is by and large for most applications going to be about the same. Now, there are some specific large applications which ran particularly slow under App V. Um, some of those were related to um, the registry, I believe, based on the way the application starts up. It, it tries to enumerate a lot of registry keys that don't exist that you know it's trying to query and say tell me what's under this key and that key doesn't exist um that was always a cause of big slowdown so i would see applications like um arcgis that the launch time of the application was really slow because of that we don't see that type of slowdown here under msix so as long as the app is able to work and you're able to get all of the features working you need to that's great I can't say that I have that answer as a positive on AutoCAD, which he mentioned, but someday. Yeah. Someday. I think these are all of the questions. So um, thank you all for joining us. If you want to join us in live, in person, uh, Tim and I will be this uh, October. October, yeah. Early October in Netherlands at the AppManag event. And uh, that's where we basically meet every year with the fellows from the industry and where we share what's, uh, what's new from our side. Microsoft is joining us for in the last years too. So you get the chance to, to ask a question and, um, and see what they are delaying things that we're requesting for years <laughs> or not. But uh, it's always great to meet in person and have a, a chat with, with the friends yeah, from the industry. I, I want to highlight that as well. I think if you are in Europe and you're in this space, that is definitely the show that you want to get to, um, to just hang out with, with you know, folks like, like Bogdan and myself and, and everybody else who's in this space. They're all there and it is a very 
open kind of community and um, everyone is out there really trying to help you. Well, thank you, Tim, for joining us. Uh, get Go get your golf uh, clubs ready. Because, uh, uh, not tomorrow morning. Tomorrow, tomorrow morning. morning. Too okay. late in the day for me now. <laughs> it's too hot out. It's too hot out. <laughs> How about we're pushing 90s here? So it's uh, what, what's your weather in Boston? Uh, it, it's, it's not quite that hot, but our humidity is 90. Oh, yeah, I don't like that. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for joining us today. Looking forward to meeting in person in a few months. And um, let's see what we can bring to the table for our friends in the, the NMSX sphere in, uh, in the future. All right. It was great catching back up with you. Me too. Have a great day, Tim. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.